What's going on everybody? Mortem here, this time bringing you my review after 100% for Colony Ship, an isometric CRPG set on a ship in the vastness of space. Though before we get into all that to get my usual stuff out of the way, I review games after 100% all the time to set me apart from other reviewers on the platform, and while that does include the achievements, it also includes a lot more than that. If you're curious about everything that I cover, there's a video linked in the description below that goes over it, and my Steam profile is public and linked below as well. Though on that note, Colony Ship is a game that spent a significant amount of time in early access, which was more or less the full game as new things were added, but because of that, a lot of guides and information had been out there for quite some time, so getting 100% on this one wasn't too challenging, as a lot of that had been cataloged already, and there was an especially helpful guide on Steam that was essentially a full walkthrough of the game that helped me a ton, in terms of tracking down specific things I was missing. But as I mentioned, and I'm sure you've seen on screen, Colony Ship is an isometric CRPG developed by Iron Tower Studios, the same company behind Age of Decadence and Dungeon Rats. And this game, much like the studio's previous work, is a game that focuses a lot on choice and consequence, while at the same time definitely letting you fail if you walk into a situation potentially unprepared. And while I would say Colony Ship is more forgiving than Age of Decadence was, that style of gameplay in general isn't going to be for everyone, and we'll touch on the difficulty of it here soon. Though if that isn't a deal breaker for you, I think Colony Ship has a really interesting setting and world to dig into centered around a generational ship in space, as we take on the role of a shipborn. Someone who was born on this ship and will likely die on it, especially if you don't play your cards right, as this giant space freighter took off from Earth many years ago in a mission to land on and colonize a new planet, with the journey expected to take several lifetimes. So needless to say, there's a fair bit to talk about, so let's jump into that. Though, as with pretty much any new game, I do want to talk about the technical state, and in that regard, I'm happy to say that Colony Ship is running very well, definitely showing off its years in early access there. The bugs I ran into were very minimal, with the, I would say, most pressing one being that occasionally, if you had a full party of companions, sometimes they would lock you into position and make you unable to move. Because the game features is a small fast travel system that pretty much allows you to fast travel from most anywhere, this was usually pretty easy to work around. With the only other notable bug I experienced being a quest-related one where a quest sent me to talk to someone who had actually died and for whatever reason this didn't seem to register, but luckily there were other options to complete that quest. But overall, from a technical standpoint, the game seems to be in a pretty good place, which isn't a surprise given its very reserved system requirements. Moving on from there though, when you first start a new game, the first thing you're going to encounter is the difficulty options. You can choose between either hero or underdog, which is effectively the difference between easy and normal, though depending on how you're playing the game, there might not even be a substantial difference between the two. For instance, if you're going for a pacifist run of this game, which is possible, which is going to see you avoiding pretty much all the combat anyway, you're likely to not really notice a significant difference between the two. But if you want to go full combat, that is to say trying to fight everything, which is also necessary for one of the achievements, you'll notice it quite a bit, because in that regard, Hero's going to be much easier. And while this does also affect other things, such as your skill gain, which means it's easier to make a sort of jack-of-all-trades character on Hero difficulty with a party size of four, that can be pretty easily worked around as well. So the primary difference between these two is how difficult the combat is going to be, as well as your starting gear. So while underdog is the sort of default difficulty, if you want to make things a little easier on yourself, hero difficulty in terms of combat is going to give you bonuses to hit, as well as giving the enemy penalties to hit, on top of better gear right at the start of the game. It's important to know, though, when it comes to this choice, even if you're playing on hero difficulty, if you walk into a combat situation unprepared, you're likely to just get murdered by the action economy, as you will simply be vastly outnumbered. So even on hero difficulty, a base understanding of what you're trying to do is necessary if you're trying to go all in on the combat. But as there are multiple ways to play through this game, as I mentioned, if you're going pacifist, you're likely not to notice much of a difference at all. Now from there, let's talk about the story of this game a little bit, and my thoughts on it. I will be avoiding spoilers for the most part outside of a general plot setup and just how much I enjoyed the story, but still, if you don't want to hear anything about this, maybe skip past it. Colony Ship takes place on a generational ship, that is to say, a ship that set forth from Earth to colonize another planet planet. It's going to take hundreds of years to get there, the people born on this ship might very well die on it without ever seeing their destination, and the people who initially left almost certainly did. However, 
some years ago, the ship's initial crew devolved into a mutiny against the ship authority, or the sort of ship government, if you will, and this saw the ship splitting into three distinct factions. And while there are more, these are the three major ones, which are the Church of the Elect, the Brotherhood of Liberty, and the Protectors of the Mission. The Protectors are all about simply fulfilling the initial mission of the ship, which is to colonize this planet they're going to arrive at, whereas the Brotherhood of Liberty was simply the mutineers behind the mutiny, of course, and thus is very much so at odd with the Protectors. The Brotherhood saw what the ship authority was doing as effectively slavery and thus rebelled against it, and have since become a major faction on the ship. And then we have the Church of the Elect which is a faction of people who have turned to religion to cope with their situation effectively, seeing the other factions as people distracted by their own egos and things while everyone else is simply trying to find salvation at this new planet. And over the course of the game, you're going to be interacting with these factions, seeing how they've divvied up and started managing the ship, along with other factions, such as the mutants who control the engines, the monks, cyborgs more or less, who control the life support systems. And you're going to have to navigate all those factions and their conflicting interests to find a resolution to various problems and trying to make your own way through life on this ship. And what I liked most about the story of this game was the premise, for starters. I really just think it's an interesting concept to have people aboard this ship for generations, kind of evolving into their own little cultures and factions, because it creates such an interesting little microcosm for all sorts of things to be explored, and that's before you even start taking into account the mutants, of course, people who have been mutated by the radiation coming off the engines, though those engines have to be maintained. So the mutants have carved out their own little world and sort of civilization around keeping the ship running so everyone leaves them alone which is a similar instance for the monks of the life support systems. And it's a really interesting look at a lot of those sort of societal dynamics there. And how you choose to move through all of those can lead you to one of seven different endings, though it's worth mentioning that four of those endings are effectively the same ending, just with who's in charge being a little different, but technically seven endings. And in many ways, I think the game succeeds at what it was trying to do there. And as a game that isn't voice acted, being mostly told through the text on screen that you've seen here. I think the writing is quite good, and I was very interested in what was happening the whole way through. Time frame wise, you're looking at probably 15-ish hours for a single playthrough, depending on what you're doing and how you do it. My first one clocked in at about 14 personally, in addition to what I had played in early access, which was only like five or six hours. My second playthrough, however, was very quick. I did a pacifist run there, and knowing where everything was and what to expect, that only took like seven. So how much you get out of this game in terms of playtime is likely to vary quite a bit, but in general for most people, I would say probably like 15 to 20. But now let's talk about character creation, which is this screen right here. And to the very left, we have all of our appearance options. We can name our character. And overall, the appearance section is pretty bare bones, as you would expect. It's a top-down CRPG, but there's a decent enough set of options there. But do remember, it's an indie game. Now, in terms of what defines your character, we have stats, skills, and feats. All of these are very important at character creation. You're going to define most of who your character is right here. And while, especially if you're on hero difficulty, there is some leeway to what you can do. On underdog in particular, it's very important. So don't take the choices you make in character creation lightly via either combat or a character focused on avoiding combat via things like sneaking and persuasion. And if you want to do a pacifist route, sneaking and persuasion are really the way to go. First and foremost, we're going to put our points into our ability scores or our attributes, whatever you want to call them, which are strength, constitution, dexterity, perception, intelligence, and charisma. The minimum they can be is four. The maximum they can be in character creation is 10, but through implants later, they can be brought up to 12. Each point in any one of these is pretty significant, and they affect all the derived stats listed below, and you can kind of see what each one of them actually does there. Strength and constitution affect your ability to have better HP, more melee damage, heavier armor, more implants, dexterity and perception affect things like your ability to take more actions in combat, how accurate you're going to be via perception, etc. But in addition to what you see here, there's going to be skill checks throughout the game, and a few of those are going to directly reference what your actual stats are, and that can either open up or lock off certain actions based on what these are. For instance, there are some things that require a high charisma score, even though it's possible to persuade people with just the skills available in the speech section, having a high charisma is still important for certain checks. Just to give one example. Now that brings us to skills. 
Right away, you can put a couple of points into various skills to pump them up a couple levels and decide what your character is going to be good at right out of the gate. But you can also tag skills, which gives them plus two to their level right away, which means here in character creation, you can potentially take a skill up to four right away. And that's important because your skills also max out at 10. And while the combat related skills will usually affect things like your chance to hit, your accuracy basically, and makes you more effective at using those weapons in combat, the other skills, however, are mostly pass or fail. There's some exceptions for things like armor and evasion, of course, but things like the science checks, the speech checks, and many of the stealth checks are simply going to have you taking action, and if your skill is high enough, you'll pass, and if it isn't, you fail such as stealing from people, or extracting implants off of bodies via biotech. You either have the skill level or you don't. Though some of them work a little bit differently. For instance, sneak makes you better at sneaking, reduces the noise you make, which allows you to potentially make your way through certain sneak sections or stealth sections, but your success in those instances isn't guaranteed. Now, outside of character creation, your skills are a level by doing system. You'll level these skills up farther by actually using them. And that's important because if you're not participating in combat, your combat skills are never going to increase, which is true of all of the skills. So that means you really want to pick the things that you are actually going to be using. Because if you're talking your way out of all of your combat situations, then there will literally be less combat experience available in the total game, which is another way the game rewards you for doing the thing you built your character for. Now that's not to say hybrid characters don't work, especially on hero where you get more skill gain, but especially for a first time through, you mostly want to focus on one thing. Though worth a mention, I would say intelligence is probably the most important because that's going to give you the ability to tag more skills, give you bonus experience, which is going to let you do more. So I always found intelligence to be important kind of no matter what I was doing. Not to say it's required, but it definitely helps. That though brings us to feats. Right away at character creation, we're going to be able to pick one feat and then afterwards, every time we level up, we can pick another one. Now, as you can see on this list here, there are heroic feats. These are only for character creation. You can pick these at character creation or not at all. So things like gifted, cult leader, dodge this, all have to be taken right away. Most of them have a requirement of a max stat, though gifted is universally useful and likely what you're going to take if you're not interested in the max stat ones. Now, later on as you're leveling up, you can take even more of these feats and they help you define your build. Now, I found these most impactful for stealth and combat specifically, because a lot of these give you huge bonuses to those things. Now, on the other end of that, if you're going for a pacifist run, like a high persuasion, no combat character, a lot of the feats aren't a ton of fun for that. There are ones that will give you extra experience, even retroactively, which can be pretty useful. But in general, if you're going the pacifist route, a lot of the feats kind of just don't apply to you. So there's that. Now, moving on from there, I want to talk about some of the game's progression systems. And we've already touched on a fair bit of that. As I mentioned, when you level up, you're going to be able to take another feat every single time, which will give you some pretty substantial boosts to your character. Another form of that progression, as we talked about, are the skills. You're going to increase these simply by using them, which will make you more effective at them and enable you to pass harder and harder checks for them. But the other two big progression systems I have yet to mention much are the implants and your gear. Gear is pretty self-explanatory. As you play through the game, you're going to find better and better gear, such as weapons that enable you to deal more damage at a lower AP cost or come with different types of attacks that do unique things. You're going to be able to find upgradable defensive gadgets that allow you to either activate a cloak and stealth through areas much easier or defensive gadgets that allow you to simply put up energy shields or distortion fields that make combat a bit easier. If you're on hero, you'll actually start with those, but if you're on underdog, you have to find them and they are much more rare. Those defensive gadgets are also upgradable. You can find parts to make them better at what they do. And depending on what type of character you're making will change what type of gear you want. As much of the armor and things like that that will give you more resistance to damage comes at the expense of your ability to sneak. And if you don't have the appropriate strength to wear it, it will tank your armor handling, which will cut into your available actions. Alongside your initiative. But then we have implants. A short ways into the game, if you go to medical bays and find a machine and have an implant, 
It's possible to replace your character's organs with implants that will increase your general effectiveness. A lot of these can increase one of your attributes by one, and later you can overclock these implants if you want to at the cost of a little bit of health to, in many cases, double their effect, which is how you can bring an attribute up to 12 if you want. Implants are bonuses, though. It is possible to play through the game without using any of them, though they will certainly help you out. How many you can have implanted is based off of your constitution, though, and then there are traits to increase the maximum as well. Each implant is also upgradable. You'll find various chips lying around that can add extra effects to them. So especially if you're going the combat route, implants can be a significant way to boost up your character. From there though, let's talk about the gameplay and the world of this game. Right away, the game throws you into an area called the Pit, which is effectively the game's version of a slum. It's a bit of a lawless area that isn't controlled by any of the three factions, though they often trade with them. As a resident of this place, you kind of just do odd jobs trying to get by in a place that is often known for its shady behavior. You are almost immediately thrown into a power struggle between the potential mayors of the area, each offering something different. And I mention this in particular because this is such a fantastic way of setting up what the game is about. Talking to people, making choices, having to deal with the effort involved in enacting those choices, because if you want to attack someone and overthrow them, that is going to lead to a potential fight if you can't find alternative solutions. And the initial starting area, the pit, is really just an exemplification of everything this game is about. There's also a variety of side quests in the area that directly showcase even more of the culture and everything that's formed up in this ship. You can find a courthouse where the only actual trial is trial by combat, and you can sign up to be a lawyer of sorts, which effectively means fighting in an arena. But assuming you don't want to just blast your way through everything, you can often search for and find alternative solutions to things, ways to talk your way out of them, or using sneaking and stealing to simply take what you want without asking anyone any questions. There's also exploration-based discoveries. As you run around individual maps, you can find unique things, maybe hidden paths to solutions you hadn't quite thought of yet, which means there are things to explore and find. Though, largely speaking, the ship is divided up into explorable areas, that you fast travel in and out of, which make up the maps more or less. You're going to travel between these by opening up the map, clicking on the new area you'd like to go, and clicking travel. This also works as a fast travel system both in between the individual maps as well as the maps themselves. So if you want to get from one end of an area to the other, it is possible to open up the fast travel section, and then if you've been there, you can just fast travel directly to, say, a shop or something you're trying to get to. Now, my only issue on that particular note is that there isn't a full map of any given area, which can make some areas where there's a lot of stuff clustered right around each other a little more difficult to navigate than you might want. And while in 90% of cases it's not a big deal to work around that, it is something that can get a little bit annoying over time. But as you're doing all that exploring, making choices, talking with all these characters, you're bound to run into some really interesting stuff. My, I would say, favorite thing about this was the mutants. The ship has been doing genetic experiments in order to make sure they have the capacity to grow food and things on the planet once they arrive there, but this has led to unintended consequences and combined with things like radiation has led to mutants. Humans who have simply adapted to their surroundings, but they are, as they often tend to be in video games like this, resistant to radiation, which makes them perfect for working on the ship's engines, which have higher than safe levels of radiation, and in exchange for keeping the ship running, everyone leaves the mutants alone. But, given that they've kind of had this almost isolated existence in the ship's engines, they've made this really interesting society that revolves around a matriarch and her daughters, as she calls them, which are simply potential successors, and that's just one of many genuinely interesting things to uncover, alongside things that push it even farther into the realm of sci-fi. But one thing that was consistently well done to me was just how compelling both the premise of this story, as well as its execution, in terms of exploring those concepts, managed to be. It was just a really good time. I was very interested in learning more about basically everything I uncovered, while at the same time affecting the outcome and well-being of basically everything you encounter. 
which often leads to consequences later. Really, I would say the only major drawback to a lot of this was simply that I wish the main faction choice mattered more. A little ways into the game, you're going to make a pretty big decision about backing one of the factions, and while there's a decent amount of, I would say, unique content leading up to that decision, after that decision is made, most everything still kind of plays out the same way, which I thought was a little unfortunate. Who you're talking to changes, but the actual situations you find yourself in are pretty much identical, which I thought was a little bit of a bummer. I would have loved to see more unique content tied to that choice, but given that it's an indie game, I can understand why that is the way it is, but it's probably the biggest criticism I have of the game overall. And that's probably a good place to start talking about the combat of this game. Now, it's important to note that whether or not to engage in combat is a choice in and of itself. And while you might feel that you've arrived at a point where the only recourse is combat, understand that you made a character that pushed you in that direction. It is possible to talk and persuade your way out of simply everything, and we'll talk about stealth and persuasion in just a moment. But right away, in the combat section here, engaging in combat is a choice you have made. And if you're on underdog difficulty, it can be quite difficult, as the enemies play by pretty much the same rules you do, which means leveling the playing field before you even get into combat is important. And you largely do that by either gathering allies or taking out enemies outside of combat via various dialogue options, approaches to certain quests, etc. But once you're actually in and engaged in combat, it's a relatively simple action point system. Each character has a bunch of action points based on their stats and things, and then you spend those action points on the things you need to do, such as activating your defensive gadget, making all sorts of attacks. The attacks available to you are largely based on the weapon you're using, of course, things like aimed shots, burst attacks if you're using an automatic weapon, if you're using a melee weapon, you have a choice between light, medium, and heavy attacks, all of which come with an increasing or decreasing cost to your action points. And as with any turn-based game, maximize the amount of actions you take is pretty much key to winning. Though, right as combat starts, there is a sort of preparation phase where you can, within a certain area, move your party around and also quickly activate their defenses before combat starts. That's especially important because, based on your stats, you're going to have an initiative number which will determine the order in which combat goes. That number is largely set so you're not rolling initiative, it simply is what it is based on everything you've got in terms of skill, gear, etc. But after that, it largely plays out as a turn-based system. Now, there are consumables and things you can use to turn the tide in your favor. There are health items, though the more you use health items, the more it will eat into your other stats during the course of that combat scenario. But then we have other things like various grenades that can poison or stun your enemies. My personal favorite were the disruptor and stasis grenades. Disruptor grenades panicked human enemies and basically cut their action points by over half, whereas your stasis grenade just outright freezes enemies in stasis, which lets you effectively take a few enemies out of the fight for a few turns while you focus on other enemies, which can really help level the playing field in a lot of instances. But more than anything, I think it's important to understand that combat is largely stat-based, and if you don't have the stats for combat, you should be doing it. That said, if you prepare for combat, you have a full party of companions, which we'll talk about momentarily, and you've taken the appropriate steps to even the odds in your favor at least, combat is certainly not unapproachable, but I imagine it'll be the most polarizing portion of this game for a lot of people. But do keep in mind that even if you are completely specced out for combat, there is a percentage chance to a lot of stuff, which means sometimes the RNG just doesn't go your way, especially on underdog difficulty, where they largely have the same chance as you do. Sometimes they'll crit and you'll miss. Luckily, the game auto-saves at basically every story encounter and at the start of every combat encounter, so just trying again is a relatively trivial ordeal. Now, I mentioned companions. There are quite a few of them. They all have their own personalities. Many of them are associated with the various factions, so you definitely can't recruit all of them in every run, and some will only join you temporarily here and there. And while I don't want to go over each and every one of them, I do think each of them has a nice little story. It's nothing crazy, like don't expect Bioware levels of writing here, but you can have conversations with these people. Some of them have quests associated with them. 
system that allows you to both learn more about that person specifically and the ship at the same time, especially the faction-related ones, of course. And many of them, depending on the choices you make, might very well leave your entourage if you do something they're fundamentally against. And given that their previous work didn't really have a huge focus on party dynamics, with Age of Decadence seeing you as a largely solo individual, this game having full-blown companions that are fairly compelling for what they are was really nice to see, a step in the right direction for the studio to be sure. Now, you might be wondering how those companions interact with the world and how their skills come up. Well, basically, with your companions, there's a party management screen that you can activate, and you can set from here all sorts of various things, like whether or not you want to heal up with your med kits after combat, reload your weapons automatically, etc. Well, from that screen, you can set what individual character, usually the highest score, of course, who takes on each individual type of skill check. So it's possible to have your character focused on, say, biotech and persuasion, while one of your companions handles something like lockpicking or stealing. The persuasion system. One of my favorite ways to play this game was the pacifist route where you just kind of persuade everyone to do what you want because oftentimes people would present you with a conflict and your character could be like, now let me tell you why that's dumb. But this focuses on a few things. You see, each faction you interact with has an actual reputation associated with them, so how you've treated them previously sets your initial disposition with members of that faction, alongside your character's charisma stat. And then, when you attempt to persuade them, a bar will pop up showing their initial disposition based on your actions and charisma, and then as you pass various speech checks, you can add to their disposition, and if you get it to 10, you can persuade them to do the thing you want to do. Now, your skills can overcome most instances of your charisma or reputation being bad. However, if their initial disposition based off your charisma and previous actions is just like way in the negatives, there's a fair chance you'll never be able to persuade them regardless of how good you are at it. Plus, persuasion is largely a mixture of the three persuade skills, which are literally persuasion, streetwise, and impersonate. What's more, how effective each one of these particular checks are on a given character based on what you're saying can change a little bit. So while there are plenty of instances where you can simply pass one check to change the uh, outcome of a quest, let's say, there are situations where you're going to have to play this little persuasion mini game with characters, so I wanted to explicitly mention how a lot of that worked. And the last thing to leave off on is stealth. So combat and stealth are technically different, though stealth is done in turn-based sections as well, and if you fail and are spotted in certain situations, this might lead to combat immediately afterwards. But while you are in stealth, the game puts you in turn-based mode, of course, and guards are walking around on their turn as normal, and cameras as well. So cameras and guards will have vision cones, things like that, and this is represented by green, yellow, and red squares. Green squares are safe to be on. Yellow squares are safe to move through, but you cannot end your turn on there without being spotted. Stepping into a red square will fail the stealth, basically. Now, based on the skills of your character, will determine the sort of sight range and how much noise you are making. So having a high stealth character is still important because otherwise you simply might not have an opening to slip through, or you might be making too much noise because as you participate in the stealth mode, the noise level of anything you come close to will start increasing their detection meter. Obviously, when guards' detection maxes out, they've discovered you. So that's something you have to watch for as well. Now, a lot of all of that can be mitigated via the cloaking device I mentioned way earlier. Earlier, which is one of our defensive gadgets that lets your character go invisible. You'll still make noise, but it is much, much easier to actually move, as this greatly reduces the vision cones of everything. Now, some stealth missions are really, really easy and can be won simply by having a cloaking device active, kind of regardless of your skills. Other, more difficult ones absolutely require you to have a stealth character. And while combat, persuasion, and stealth largely make up most of your available options, you might be wondering, well, what happens if you fail all of them? You can't beat something in combat, you fail the stealth mission to go get it, and you lack the skills to persuade someone. Well, the game will continue in a lot of these cases. There is a sort of fail state for many of the main objectives where you just simply cannot do a lot of it, where it makes sense, of course. But in some cases, if you fail every possibility for a situation, it will send you back to the quest giver who just kind of thinks less of you and you don't get a reward as a result. So even then, sometimes there's still a way forward, which I thought was honestly really funny in the case where it came up. 
But that finally brings us to our Steam Deck section. Now the Steam Deck for this particular game is interesting because Steam's official rating for it is unsupported, but I found that to not really be accurate, and I'm surprised the game doesn't have a rating of playable. As I can get the game running, and with some tweaks it's definitely a very playable experience, but I do think there are some things that get in the way of that, and if you're not dedicated to fixing them, playing this on the Steam Deck might not be for you. For starters, the game does not have official controller support, which means you need to set up the keys appropriately, and while there is a community layout for the controls that works quite well called Colony Deck. If you don't like that one, you're in for a rough time. And I found this especially necessary because the camera for the game likes to sort of just fly all over the place. It is very sensitive, even with the sensitivity turned all the way down on the Steam Deck for some reason. The camera really just takes off whenever you pan anywhere, so that can take some getting used to. And as I'm sure you've seen on screen, a lot of the text is going to be quite small on that tiny screen which can make it a little bit of a strain on the eyes to read. But all of those in most situations would normally give a game a rating of playable, so I'm a little confused why this one is listed as unsupported, because it does clearly run, and with some tweaks, you could absolutely play this game on the Steam Deck. But again, probably not the best experience, I admit. That does, though, finally bring us to our positives and negatives. Now, on the positive side of things, I really appreciated all the choice and consequence available, because outside of the faction not giving quite as much unique content as I would have liked, there are still a ton of ways to resolve each individual situation, which can lead to all sorts of outcomes and consequences later down the line. And a lot of that is really fun to see and interact with, combined with the approaches around like stealth, persuasion, dialogue, other more exploration-based solutions. And there's a lot of fun to be had just exploring the content of this game. And the other big positive for me was simply the premise. I love the idea at play here and how much they explored it. I think the idea of this generation ship in space and the culture and societies that formed aboard were incredibly compelling, and I think they nailed the execution. I think it's a really cool idea for a game. It worked very well. Now, on the negative side of things, a lot of it, I think, can be chalked up to the game being an indie, but still, the exploration is a little bit limited because you are on what are relatively small maps, and what exploration is available is definitely down to the skills available to your character, so if you're wanting to explore the ship, there's only so much of that to be had. And what little there is there can be hampered a bit by the lack of a proper map. And while the fast travel system does, again, eliminate this alongside the map size from being a huge issue, there are occasions where it's like, I would really love to be able to just pull up a map of this area to make my life a little easier, and there simply isn't one. And probably my biggest one was simply the lack of unique content after you pick a faction. Not to say it doesn't have consequences, it's just that everything that plays out after that is kind of just one side of the same thing, with the difference being who you're talking to. I would have loved to see more variation from each individual faction beyond just the specifics of the dialogue, but the goal being always the same. Though that's hardly a problem unique to this game specifically, but it was still a bit of a bummer. That does, however, bring me to my conclusion which is that Colony Ship is a fantastic indie isometric CRPG that focuses on choice and consequence alongside a ton of features that enable convenience and quickly moving through a lot of those various options. It's not out to waste your time. There's a ton of ways to play through the game, different builds to try, different difficulties, and you can tell the studio learned a lot from their already quite good Age of Decadence release. So when it comes to recommending this game, right now it is up for $40 US, on Steam, which will of course vary based on your region, but for that price I think you're getting a great replayable indie RPG that has a lot to offer and some really compelling things. The main thing I would say to people on the fence about it, especially in regards to the difficulty in the combat, is that there is a demo available on the store's Steam page as well, which will give you a direct feel for how things like the combat are, and you can decide if it's the game for you. But if that's not a significant obstacle to you, then I think Colony Ship is a great game with an interesting world to explore. If anything, I would have loved to have seen what they could have done with a bigger budget and more options, because this game was a ton of fun. But that is pretty much all I've got for you guys today. I certainly hope you enjoyed it. If you did, like, comment, subscribe, all that YouTube jazz. Let me know down below what you think about Colony Ship. But regardless of any of that, truly, just thank you so much for watching. I really do appreciate it. May you wander in wisdom and have an amazing day.